Hey guys, today is the day we're going to learn how to identify some species other than squirrels. We're starting with large herbivores, which includes both deer and cattle species, as well as a few other species groups that constitute large herbivores, like pigs. There are also several, and I mean several, introduced species in this grouping, and I decided to include them here because, depending on the area, and I'm looking at you, Texas, you will find these animals. And I don't want to lie to you and tell them that they're not here, so I'm including them. Now let's start. The first one we're going to be looking at is the white-tailed deer, which is probably the most common species of deer in North America. I'm going to start with these two pictures of the male's antlers because this is a distinction it has from the mule deer, which is a very similar species we'll be looking at shortly. Note how its antlers have one main branch with several forks off of it. That's important. Another important thing to note is the, the tail, which is brown with white underneath, and when you spook it, as you may do when walking around in the woods, it'll run away and put its tail up, exposing the white part, which is why it's called the white-tailed deer. The mule deer's tail is very different, so this is important too. Now for the female, identification will also involve looking at the tail for the same reason. The young are spotted and reddish-brown, as seen in the photo on the top right, and there's also a subspecies of the white-tailed deer called the key deer, which is found in the Florida Keys, and it's significantly smaller than all the other subspecies of white-tailed deer, and you can see that, that in the top left. The range of the white-tailed deer extends all over North America, with the exception of the desert southwest, most of California, and most of the boreal forest in the tundra. The mule deer is a species of deer found all over the western half of North America, mostly in the mountain states, but also in some of the plains states. It looks very similar to the white-tailed deer with a couple of major differences, the first one being its big ears, which are much bigger than the white-tailed deers and are also the main reason they're called the mule deer. The second difference is its tail. The most common form is present in the top left picture, the one with the antlers, as you can see, the tail is white with a black tip. In the black-tailed deer subspecies, which you can see in the bottom left picture, the tail is black with a white rump underneath. Kind of like the white-tailed deer, but with black instead of brown. The last major difference is in the antlers. The mule deer's antlers form two main branches instead of just the one in the white-tailed deer. Look at the male's right antler in the picture above for the best view of this. And lastly, in the young, the fawns are darker colored than the white-tailed deer fawns, as you can see in the top right picture. Elk are a species that used to be found all over North America, but they were overhunted in the past and now occupy a much smaller range consisting of mostly the western United States and Canada. It's also found over in Siberia and China, too. It is notable for its dark brown head and neck, pale brown body, and cream-colored rump. The male has a shaggy neck as well as antlers with one main branch and several forks off of them. The Sika deer is the first of the introduced species you'll be hearing about today. It is originally found in East and Southeast Asia and has been introduced mostly into Texas, but also some other states like Oklahoma, Kansas, and Wisconsin, where there are smaller range areas. It is one of three in introduced species with spots, though in the winter it is unspotted. It's got a very short tail, which is white and ringed with a black semicircle. It also has a dark line going down its back, which you may be able to see in these pictures. This is another introduced species, the fallow deer. It's native to Europe and the Middle East, and it's been introduced in North America all over the place, including Texas, California, BC, Kentucky, Nebraska, and Alabama. It has a long tail, which is black on the back and white on the underside, with a black semicircle around the rump. The male's antlers are also diagnostic. They almost look like moose antlers, but they're not. Also, during the summer, these fallow deer will always have spots, but they lose them during the winter, so you can't rely on those for identification purposes. The axis deer, or chital, is native to India, and it's been introduced to North America, mostly in Texas, where it's quite abundant but also in California. It's spotted all year round, and it's the only one of the three spotted deer species with no black on its rump. The male's antlers are simple with just one or two forks on them. 
the sambar deer is originally from India and Southeast Asia, and it's been introduced to small areas of the United States in Texas, California, and Florida. It's dark brown, which is good enough to identify it from all the other introduced deer species, and it also has antlers with three points, as you can see here. It's also fairly large for a deer, about 400 to 700 pounds. And we're back to native species. This is the caribou, also known as reindeer. They are found up in the Arctic Circle, both in North America and Eurasia. It's dark brown with a pale neck area, and it has unique antlers which go forward and back. The peri caribou is a subspecies found only in the far north of Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. And it's somewhat smaller and almost all white, with unique spindly antlers. You can see it in the small picture in the bottom right. Next we have moose, which is a big dark brown deer with moose antlers. I don't know how else to describe them. Fun fact, these guys are called elk in Eurasia, which can be confusing at times, and North American elk are called red deer in Eurasia. Anyway, moose are mostly found in the boreal forests of northern North America, as well as a bit of the northern Rocky Mountains. Pronghorn are, another fun fact, not a type of deer. They're not really anything. They're pronghorn, they have their own family within the order Artiodactyla, which also includes all of the other species we're looking at today. They're found all over the western United States and some of Alberta and Saskatchewan. It's light orange-brown with white markings all over its sides, face, and rump. The male has the horns that it's named for, and they look like that on the left. Uh, the female actually has horns too, but they're barely visible. And another fun fact is that these guys are the second fastest runners in the world after the cheetah. The collared peccary is actually not a type of pig, though it looks a lot like it. It's in a separate family from the pigs. It's found in southern Texas, Arizona, and a bit of New Mexico. It's identifiable from the wild boars you might see by the fact that it has no tail, and it also has a pale collar of fur around its neck. The wild boar is an introduced species from Eurasia, which has now spread across the southern United States and California. It's larger than the collared peccary, and it's got a long tail and large ears. Its young are also striped, and you can see one of those on the right side of the screen. This is another introduced species from India, and it's been introduced to Texas and the Channel Islands of California. It's within the cattle family, and it's considered to be an antelope. The male has distinctive spiraled horns, and the female looks similar to a pronghorn. However, the pronghorn has white markings on its face, sides, and rump, and the black buck female does not. The American bison can be distinguished from all other species by looking at it, honestly. It can be distinguished by the bison's massive size, upward-facing horns, and big mane. They used to be found all over North America, but are now confined to specific sites all over the Midwest, the prairies, and some parts of the Rocky Mountains and the boreal forests. The musk ox is also a very distinctive species, with its horns extending out to either side, and long fur. It's found only in the high Arctic of Nunavut, Greenland, and parts of the Northwest Territories, Alaska, and also in Siberia and Svalbard. The Nilgai is another introduced species from India, and it's been introduced to southern Texas. It's fairly distinctive, with a small head for its body and white bands on its ankles. The male is dark gray, whereas the female is yellow gray. The mountain goat is found all over the Rocky Mountains, more so in the northern regions than the southern. It's all white, with horns that stick straight up. Doll's sheep, also known as the thin-horned sheep for reasons you'll see in a minute, is found all over the northernmost part of the Rocky Mountains from British Columbia up to Alaska. The typical form is the picture on the far right where they are entirely white, which is found in the northern part of the range, Yukon and Alaska. The stone sheep is the form pictured in the center, which is the subspecies found in British Columbia. It's gray with paler spots all over. Also note that the male is the one with the big horns, and the female is the one with the little horns, as you can see in the right picture. The bighorn sheep, as opposed to the thinhorn sheep, is found all over the western United States and some of southwestern Canada in rocky areas. 
They have brownish fur with a white, a white rump, and of course the male has big horns, while the female has smaller horns. And we're going to finish off with some introduced species, the first of which is the Barbary sheep, originally from North Africa, which has been introduced to Texas, California, and New Mexico. It's very easily identifiable by its long mane and yellow-brown coloration, not to mention its horns, which are upright and facing outward. The mouflon is the species that sheep were domesticated from. It's originally from Europe and the Middle East, and it's been introduced to Texas. It has distinctive horns on the male, where it faces outwards and comes back around behind the head. The female lacks horns altogether, which separates it from any other species of sheep or goat in this area. And that's it. The next video I'm going to make will be on large carnivores, and I'm going to follow that up with some small carnivores and seals and sea lions. If you liked the video and you thought it was informative, leave a like, and if you want to see more of this content, you should subscribe. See you later.